This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own Self Work. Hi, and welcome, or welcome back, as I usually say, to Self Work. I'm delighted you're here. I'm Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. I've been in practice for over 25 years and decided last year to basically extend the walls of my practice, as I like to say, so that I could reach more people, maybe even people who would never consider darkening the door of a therapist, but are a little curious about what someone like me might think or have to say about different issues. We cover really diverse topics, so one podcast episode may be right down your alley and another may not have too much to do with you, but I've been told by some that it still helps to listen. I have some very exciting news that I'm now free to share with you. Many of you have listened to the podcast on Perfectly Hidden Depression. It was actually number three and four. I wanted to get into the queue very, very early because I'm so passionate about the topic. I didn't know if I'd last 10 episodes or now this is my 70th episode of Self Work. Well, the big news is I have signed a book contract with New Harbinger Publications for a book on PhD or Perfectly Hidden Depression. I've been trying for about two and a half years to get this done and you are one of the reasons it's happening because I had to grow my audience in order to get the attention of a publisher. So you're part of my celebration, and I cannot, cannot thank you enough. The book won't be out till next year, but I'll be giving you updates. And again, you have my gratitude. Today, we're going to be talking about when you love someone who won't get help for themselves, who you see really, really struggling with depression or anxiety, PTSD maybe, or an eating disorder, whatever it is that they're struggling with, but they refuse to see it. I've done one episode on loving someone with recurrent depression, but today we're going to be focusing a little more on men. Now, women can certainly deny that they're in any kind of trouble, but many more women come into therapy than men, so we're going to focus on men. I do also want to say that this episode is sponsored by Audible.com, and a little later in the program, I will give you an offer from Audible. Actually, it's from Audible and me. For a free book. In this episode, I'm going to give you a model of therapy that I believe in that perhaps is a little more palpable for men to consider. One of the reasons why we need to talk about this so much is that suicide rates are going up dramatically for men. And men have more of what are called completed suicides, which is an awful sounding term, obviously. But when men attempt suicide, they usually are more successful, so to speak. And then I'm going to offer seven thoughts about what you as the person who love someone who will not get help, how you can approach it. The email from a listener today is from a man who's married to someone he believes experiences perfectly hidden depression, so right along this topic. So thanks again for being here, kind of a long intro, and we'll get right to talking about people who won't get help. As I said in the intro, many more women than men actually enter therapy every year. And why is that? I was curious about that. So a couple of years ago, I conducted some studies through a survey that would certainly not meet any psychological standards of excellence, but I distributed it through some bloggers that volunteered to put it on their website, people from all over the country. And I got about 1,500 responses from men and about 1,500 responses from women. I did two separate surveys. Well, in the survey about men, the chief reason they would not consider coming into treatment was because, guess what, I can fix it myself. Interestingly enough for women, it was due to the fact that other people might find out. So they were more concerned with stigma. Men were more concerned with their independence and their freedom, more sort of stoicism. And you know, when this result occurred, I thought about some of the things that I'd learned how to do. And I would smile when I thought about it. I remember the first toilet I ever fixed. And doing things yourself makes you feel good. 
you learn from mistakes and you enjoy your successes. I get all that. And yet when you think about it, there are many instances that all of us choose not to do something for ourselves, but turn to the expertise of someone else. You can file your own divorce for sure, or you can go to a lawyer. You can prepare your own meals, or you can go out to a restaurant. You can organize your own business finances, or you can go to an accountant. You can pray alone, or you can listen to a pastor's sermon. And you know, I could go on and on. So here's my thought. What's so different about mental health? We consult with so many people for their expertise. In fact, we even admire leaders who surround themselves with people whose opinions are different from their own. We want them to ask for advice, and we admire questioning whether or not they have all the answers. So a therapist isn't any different. She or he has expertise based on either a few years or even months of experience, but they have graduate school, I guess or school of some kind. But many seasoned clinicians have years of experience. And you know, it's kind of funny, I started thinking about how therapists are portrayed on television and the movies, and we've had quite diverse (laughs) personalities and characters playing therapists. Everybody from Bob Newhart years ago to Lisa Kudrow, who's doing internet therapy these days, or did a few years ago. So we certainly have examples of what therapy might look like, or sound like. But still, many men believe it's not for them. Therapy's too touchy-feely. Now, if you've been to a really good therapist or talked to someone who has, you'll find out something different. Yes, therapy involves focusing on feelings, and yes, the relationship is a supportive one, but therapy is hard work. Whatever technique they use, whether it's EMDR, cognitive behavioral, or emotionally focused, it takes harsh honesty with yourself. The therapist isn't there to tell you what to do, to take over your life, or to solve your problems for you. They're there as a guide and a reflection, plain and simple. In fact, many of the men I've seen will tell you therapy is the hardest work they've ever done, whether they have PTSD from serving in the military, a problem with porn, relationship struggles, abuse from their past, the abandonment of a parent, whatever it is, anger management, Confronting your struggles is tough. A recent guy I was seeing said, you know, I was worried about what it would feel like to get therapy. I thought maybe I'd feel like less of a man, but I actually feel more masculine, more in control of what I'm doing. Depression had confused me and sapped my energy. I was doing stupid things to avoid how I felt. Now I'm much more clear about what I need to do, even though it means learning some new things. In 25 years, I've seen... Hundreds, if not thousands, yeah, in fact, thousands of patients. And I can tell you, I've only gained in respect for the men and women that I've worked with who risk connecting with emotions they believe they couldn't feel without breaking and who chose to talk about their abuse or their pasts or their present so they can heal. And they didn't break, they got stronger. Now, I mentioned before that suicide rates are going up, especially in middle-aged men. They're going up in all ages, which is something I've talked about on the podcast. So it seems to me it's time to address this reticence to talk about what's really going on. Now, in the intro, I told you that this particular episode is sponsored by Audible.com. I'm delighted to have them as a sponsor. If you go to my website, you'll see I don't advertise anything on there, and I've stayed away from some offers for this podcast, but when Audible reached out to me, I thought, you know, this is sort of a win-win. I think the offer is very fair. You get one month of a free trial of audible.com and a free book. If you don't like it, you can unsubscribe, but you get to keep the book. So there's your win-win. Now I do get some money from them, a commission of sorts, But what I decided to do was whatever commission I make from audible.com, I'm going to donate to St. Jude's Children's Hospital. It's a great hospital that offers free care and free housing, free accommodations, everything to children with cancer and their families. It's in Memphis. And the book I'm going to recommend is one that I have many men in my practice read, which is I Don't Want to Talk About It by Terrence Reel. Now, you can get whatever book you want. But I Don't Want to Talk About It is a really great book for men to read. 
So all you have to do is go to audibletrial.com slash self-work. That again is audibletrial.com slash self-work. And you can sign up for one month free audible.com and get whatever free book you'd like. It's a win for you. It's a win for me. And it's a win for St. Jude's. Thanks so much. So now we're going to get back to what you can do for someone else that you love, be it man or woman, who's refusing to seek treatment or even deny they have a problem. I certainly know what doesn't work. Pleading doesn't work. Rebuking, no, not good. Avoiding it or not talking about it at all, that's not good. Enabling it, not good. Telling him about other people that have gone into therapy, (laughs) that never works. But there are some things you can do. Here's some ideas. Get into therapy yourself. Model for him what trying to move forward is like. I've always said I can do marital therapy with one person in the room. It's kind of amazing. One person starts changing and the other person will begin to alter their behavior as well in response because they know you're in therapy and they just might get curious. So first is to get into therapy yourself. The second, and really perhaps maybe the most important, is to talk about what it's like for you to see him struggle, whether it's depression, anxiety, whatever. You focus on and tell him what feelings you're having. You make I statements. For example, I watch you struggling and I feel so helpless. Or, I know you love the kids, but when I see you go play a video game instead of being with them, I don't know what to think. Or, I don't see any light in your eyes anymore, and I so want to see that again. I miss you. You see, so you're talking about what you're going through watching them, rather than trying to force them or get them to admit what they're going through. They can say, well, I don't know why you're feeling that way. I'm just fine. And you say, well, from my perspective, I'm just sharing with you what I see and what I'm feeling. The third one is to ask him how you can help him. He may say there's nothing you can do because there's nothing wrong, but keep on asking, not in a real petulant way or a demanding way, but just, you know, is there anything I can do for you? And again, the fourth one is dependent on the severity of his symptoms, but you may have to set some boundaries. Now, he may hear that as a threat, But for example, if his drinking becomes too heavy or he's spending hours away from home and you don't know where he is, then you have to decide what you have to do for yourself and the rest of your family. We talked a little about setting boundaries in the last podcast where we featured victim and savior relationships. Boundaries are often not welcome. Someone will say, what, you're drawing a line in the sand, but you're simply saying, I know what I have to do given the circumstances. The fifth is to encourage him to talk with someone he trusts. It could be his old high school best friend, his pastor, his doctor, or one of his work colleagues. You can ask him to get another perspective. If you can't hear me, then talk to Tom or run this by your dad or whoever you think he trusts and will also give him an honest answer who's not stuck in denial themselves. That won't help at all. So someone you believe that might be able to talk with him in a very open manner. The sixth is important. Reassure him that you love him. Men as a gender struggle with feeling like they're failing the people that count on them when they hear disappointment or anger or frustration. They immediately feel like they've messed up and that your unhappiness is their responsibility and they will turn away or get angry when they feel like failures. So you don't want him to feel that way. Just because he's depressed or anxious, or whatever it is, doesn't mean he's completely botching things. And that's important for him to hear, that you still appreciate things about him. The last is, again, above all, to take care of yourself, because depression can be contagious. So you have to care for yourself as well. I'm going to include a link to the suicide hotline, just in case anyone listens to this who might be struggling with depression and suicidal ideation. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. 
8255. And I'll have that number in the show notes. Our email from a listener today is from a husband. I've listened intently and with great interest to your Perfectly Hidden Depression podcasts. It's like it has been written from my wife's lifetime experience. She's had numerous life events and traumas, the most notable being sexual assault, loss of a parent, and a recent serious injury. My wife is a perfectionist and is always asked to do tasks as they will get done well. She rarely shows emotion to those who annoy her, puts on a happy, bright public facade, is very popular, always listens to everyone else's problems, but never discusses her own, and says since a child she's always suppressed her feelings and emotions. She frequently tells me her problems are put in a box and put away on the highest shelf. If the box is not big enough, then she gets a bigger box. Last year, she had an affair claiming the partner made her happy. I thought our marriage was solid, but now it's at rock bottom. She's now withdrawn, seeks isolation, refuses even a hug. She states she feels nothing, claiming loss of attraction or love for me. My wife would not be receptive to the suggestion she's getting depressed, but I would welcome any ideas you may have that may help her. I realize she's struggling emotionally and as difficult as it is, I intend to remain loyal. This is one important point that the people with perfectly hidden depression run out of steam and then begin to show the classic or traditional signs of depression. And that certainly sounds like what this husband is describing. So I'll answer his question. It sounds as if your wife is the kind of person I'm trying to reach with my work on perfectly hidden depression. From your description and for some long ago reasons, she began using a very rigid strategy of compartmentalization, that box she talks about. It's a healthy skill to have unless it's the only strategy known and it's used to excess. It would seem that that's exactly what she has been doing and, in fact, all she knows to do. But as many of the people I've talked with and actually worked with, something is happening and the pain she's in is seeping out of the corners of that box. She's developed traditional classic depression. She's right, in a way. Talking about things can feel worse at first. In fact, many people have said to me, if I started crying or feeling anything, I'd never stop. But that's not the case. They do stop. But it takes work, self-compassion, and time. I do wonder if she might secretly listen to a podcast if you send her the link. She may, of course, chalk it up to being psychological mumbo-jumbo, but she might also recognize herself in the stories. And then I give him a couple of books, Brene Brown's work, The Gifts of Imperfection, and Kristen Neff's work on self-compassion, both really good books that I'll have in the show notes for you. I also believe that perhaps part of her turning away from you and having an affair has something to do with her depression. You might be able to get her into marital work if she doesn't want to focus on herself. And that might be a way to get her into treatment that she can tolerate. I certainly hope that she's miserable enough to think outside of that box. If she says she's happy, but she describes being numb, that doesn't sound very happy to me. She simply sounds afraid. I'm so glad you were here today with me on Self Work. I've got loads of things coming up in the next few months for self-work, changes, transitions, keeping what's good about the old and bringing in some new. I'm real excited about it. More to come there. But you can reach out to me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com by email, which is confidential, and I will answer your question or read your comment. If you don't want to be on the podcast or for me to use your email, just tell me and I won't. My website where I post weekly is drmargaretrutherford.com. I've been blogging there for five years, so there are a lot of topics covered over there. And if you subscribe to that particular website, you'll get not only a newsletter containing my weekly podcast, but also my weekly blog post. 
Of course, you can subscribe wherever you listen. And I so appreciate the people who've recently left ratings and reviews on iTunes. Thank you so much. I was at 90 last time I said anything, and now I'm almost at 100. So I would love it if a few more of you would give me a rating and a review. The reviews are especially important to me because I get to know what people are liking or perhaps not liking so much about self-work. But wherever you listen, if you could do that, I'd so appreciate it. I want to thank Audible.com for sponsoring this episode. Oh, and I have one more plug, and it's an unabashed plug. I do have a little gift book that I wrote, Marriage is Not for Chickens, which when it appeared on the Huffington Post, got 200,000 likes and 53,000 shares. So I made it into a book. It's a perfect gift book for anyone celebrating an anniversary, getting married, getting engaged, whatever. It's called Marriage is Not for Chickens, and it's available on Amazon.com. Thanks so much for listening. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and you've been listening to Self Work.